Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's assume for a moment that you were Rip Van Winkle. Most people have heard of Rip Van Winkle. Have you, have you who has heard of Rip Van Winkle? No? Raise your hand to the line. Pardon? You practice being Rip all the time? Well, as I understand the story, is that he and David decided to go one day and take a nap, and they didn't wake up for 50 years. Is that right? By that time, he'd retired from Pittsburgh. No. In any case, uh, Rip Van Winkle went to sleep, and when he awakened, the world seemed extremely different to him. I would wager the guess that for many of you who have lived 50, 60, 70, 80 years, when you get up in the morning, even though the change has been gradual, some of you would conclude that this is a strange world that you're living in. Things have changed so much that it's hardly recognizable, not only in terms of the way we communicate and the way we travel, but in so many other ways. One of my favorite uh, theologians by the name of Walter Brueggemann wrote a story one time or an article one time in which he stated that the biggest change that has occurred in the United States is that, first of all, we no longer have God as the primary actor in our story. We have replaced him with all sorts of other secondary elements. Second of all, he indicated that even though many people still believe in God, they really don't talk about him or talk to him all that much except on Sunday morning. And finally, he said, we no longer use scripture as a guide to our daily living. I think what he is saying, in my experience, holds absolutely, is holds to be true. We have changed in our society. As in particular, we have changed when it comes to our relationship with God. In this morning's prayer, we pray that our joyful celebration of the resurrection feast may be reflected in our daily work and conversation. Let me ask you the question. How many of you had a week this past week that was different because of the resurrection that we celebrate? How many of you this week lived your life in a different way because of the resurrection? Or is it true for you as it is true for so many people, as Walter Brueggemann points out? We have no longer have God as our primary actor. We no longer really talk to him or with him or about him during the week. And most of us don't live our lives by the scripture that has been given to us as God's word. So how did this happen? How did we get to the point where we are no longer seeing God the same way that we once saw him and the way we are challenged by scripture to see him? But I think that we have some clues when we read this gospel lesson and remember the gospel lesson for today. First of all, we find in the gospel lesson today that Thomas, what did he do? He separated himself, didn't he, from the rest of the people. He decided that he, for whatever reason, good or bad, we don't know, he decided to go on his own. He decided that he didn't need to be with his fellow church members. And there's a real risk in our society that people who have gone to the conclusion or have come to the conclusion that they really can celebrate God out in nature by themselves, that they really don't need to continue to come to worship service, that they can do it on their own, that there is no real meaning to the worship services except that you go there once a week or once every other week or once a month out of habit rather than out of any desire to worship and celebrate presence of God in our midst. And so that's the first thing. And we know, for instance, that in the gospel, not in the gospel, but in the letter to the Hebrews in the third chapter, and let me find and see, hopefully my pages won't stick together. The third chapter, we, we read, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily. And in the 10th chapter, the writer repeats it and says that we should encourage one another daily 
in order to become believers with a believing heart. And that's, I think, one of the first reasons why we've gotten to the point where we are today, which is not even to tip our hat to God, but just to go on as if he really didn't exist, living a life, if not of theological atheism, or practical atheism. So the first thing you find is that Peter, um, uh, Thomas, separated himself from the others. The second thing that we find is that by doing so, he denied himself the peace that, came, that passes all of our understanding. Remember when Jesus came to the disciples through the open, through the locked doors, what did he do? He said, peace be with you. But Thomas didn't have the benefit of that peace. And it goes on to say, peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So he denied himself the opportunity to experience the peace that comes only from Jesus. And he denied himself the blessing that could only come from the Holy Spirit. Because we read as Paul writes later on in Corinthians that we really cannot understand with our natural mind. We cannot understand the things that are from above. We can only understand them through the Holy Spirit. And so the second reason why I think Thomas can give us a clue about why people are dropping off so quickly from our churches and becoming unbelievers and disbelievers is that he denied himself not only the peace from Christ, but the power of the Holy Spirit. And what happens when you deny yourself the presence of God, when you deny yourself the presence of fellow encouraging believers? What often happens to people is that they start substituting their own ideas about what God ought to do with the ideas that you find in the Word. If you're not in the Word of God, you're going to always rely on your own understanding and on your own desires and on your own perspective in order to see whether you are going to believe or not believe. And that's exactly what Thomas does. Thomas basically says, look, Jesus, I always says to the disciples, look, I'm not going to believe in him unless what? Unless you meet certain conditions. Unless you meet certain conditions, and the conditions are that you're going to have to prove yourself to me on my terms rather than on your terms. And that's the reason he happens to us as well. We say basically something like this, if there's a, an illness or a death that we don't understand, we say, yeah, I could believe if God would only cure and prevent the death. Or I will believe as long as you get me out of this financial mess that I am. I, you, I would believe if, 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 and we have all of these conditions that we establish, none of which is a biblical condition. The condition that we establish order for God to be before we will believe. And that's exactly what happened here to Thomas. So, here we are. One of the reasons I think why it is that we um, become, a, become a nation and become a people which does not elevate, raise God to the height that he deserves, who does not, no longer enhances the reputation of Christ in our lives, we no longer live lives so that people around us say, wow, God be praised. Look what that person has done. We become people that have ignored our living world. And I think one of the reasons for doing so, as we just explored, can be understood if we understand what happened to Thomas. But we read also in the Apostle lesson from Mark, read this morning from Acts, did you notice what happened to the disciples? Did you notice what happened to the disciples? Here they were. They were scared to death in the room. Jesus comes to them. It basically greets them with peace, greets them with a purpose, greets them with power. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. What happens to these disciples? These disciples become people of courage when they were here earlier were people of fear. They are in front of the Sanhedrin. And then standing in front of the Sanhedrin, they have been preaching that Jesus is the Lord. 
which only Caesar was supposed to. They're preaching that only Jesus is the Lord, which will get the Jewish people into trouble with the Romans because they weren't allowed to say that anyone other than Caesar was true. And they keep on doing so in spite of the fact that they are told not to. In spite of the fact that they are found innocent and beaten, they still continue to preach. They still continue to spread the good news. When was the last time that you and I spread the good news? When was the last time that we had such courage that we could put aside of our fear or aside the uh, the the thought that we might be drawing attention to ourselves, that we could put that aside and really speak to somebody else about Jesus and who he is in your life. For the disciples became people of courage. And they went out and they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. What happened? Here we have the doubting disciples. Thomas wasn't the only doubter. We read in Luke, for example, that all of the disciples doubted. And not only do we read in Luke that they all doubted, but even after they had seen the nail wounds, and had seen the wounds in the sight, they continued to doubt. Unlike Thomas. So what happened? First of all, I think we have gotten ourselves into this sort of lukewarm Christianity by not celebrating, worshiping together, although many of us do, and I praise God for that. Second of all, we find that the disciples have somehow or another been caught with the power that can only come through the Holy Spirit. And so, how did these people become? How did these people become so courageous? In, their way, in the way that they preach the gospel. I think the answer lies in how God, through Jesus Christ, approached them. And this is what I would ask you to do. Think about it. How has God approached you? Has he approached you in the way that he approached the disciples and doubting times? First of all, what does he do? He comes personally. He comes personally. He doesn't send anybody. He doesn't send the very best. He doesn't send a greeting card. I'm not saying we shouldn't send greeting cards. Walmart will be up you know, on my doorstep if I do that. But he doesn't send a greeting card. He, first of all, comes personally. Second of all, he comes peacefully. He comes peacefully to the disciples and to Thomas. Third, he comes purposefully. Let me read to you. Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands. The disciples were overjoyed, and again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. That's the purpose. You see, our purpose, the disciples' purpose, was to go into the world the way Jesus went into the world. To go into the world and, and save the lost. Jesus himself said that's why he came, to save the lost. That is our purpose, people of saying. Our purpose is to spread the good news so that people will believe in the only source of salvation. He comes personally, he comes peacefully, he comes purposefully, and he comes powerfully. He comes with the, with the Lord, with, his, with the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, you might draw the conclusion that this is only applicable to the people who live, to Thomas and to the uh, disciples. But God will come that way to every one of us. He will come personally. He will come powerfully, peacefully. He will come purposefully. He will come powerfully. All of those are available to each one of us. And scripture is full of declarations where that is a spouse. So, why are we not more powerful in our witness? Why is it that we in our country are more and more becoming a secular nation? Why is it that we so often fail to really witness to others around us? Well, I think it's a lot easier for us to do it sometimes. 
Let me put it this way. Ask yourself the question. Is it to my advantage for God not to exist? Is it to my advantage for Jesus not to come personally, peacefully, purposefully, and powerfully? And I would suggest that the answer to that may surprise you. Because, let me just lay that out a little bit. You see, if I'm interested in cheating in school, in order to get a good grade for whatever reason, I don't want God at all. I don't want God looking over my shoulder. I don't want to be reminded that whatever I'm doing, God is seeing and has, has, will continue to see. If I'm cheating on my wife, I don't want to go into some hotel room and see a sign that says God is here. I don't want to be in that hotel room and be reminded that Jesus will come to me. If I'm stealing from my boss, or stealing from anyone, and stealing can best be defined as taking an advantage of others, where I get as much for myself and give as little as possible to someone else. Do I want to be reminded when I'm filling out my eternal revenue, tax papers, do I want to be reminded of God's presence in my life? And so we can continue, continue, and continue. I'm convinced that we often, in my life at least, I so often am powerless and purposelessness, experience purposelessness, because I really don't want God around. I don't want Him looking over my shoulder. And so I miss out on the blessing. I miss out on the presence of the Holy Spirit. I miss out on the commissioning that Jesus here and in other places, it gives to us the commission to go out into the world. There's one more thing that I need to point out, and, and Lynn pointed it out this, this uh, morning in the children's sermon. Jesus appears to Thomas, and we know from the confession, we know that Jesus uh, comes and says, here, look at my hands, put your finger in my, in my hand, put it in my side. Uh, in all likelihood, the way the story is written, the way the account is written, it probably, Thomas probably never did that. And before he even does it, he breaks out in a wonderful, great confession, you know, my Lord and my God, which is the only place that I'm aware of where the two are connected and before Jesus' uh, ascension. So, we find Jesus with Thomas. He breaks out into this, and then Jesus says to him, Told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Obviously, Jesus acknowledges that sight can lead to faith. But then he goes on and says, You have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, at this point, Jesus is no longer talking to the disciples. You see, all of them have seen, all of them fall into the category as Thomas that they have seen the Lord. So they don't fall into the category of believing as a result of not having seen or some other dynamic. So when Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, he is talking to everybody other than the disciples. He's talking to you and he's talking to me. He's talking to every one of us to recognize that we will be blessed if we believe. Now, if we somehow or another have the notion that seeing is believing and that seeing really leads to believe in a better way than not seeing, and I really question that. Let me just sort of throw out one aspect of this for your consideration. Many times you've seen the court dramas where you have an attorney there and, and the defendant is sitting there and in a very sort of dramatic way. And it doesn't actually happen that way. The witnesses understand and you say, you were an eyewitness, you saw all this. Can you point out for us the man who shot the young boy in the middle of the street? And the witness looks around and stands up. He's been coached by now. He looks around and stands up and he points and says, there he is. And we think that an eyewitness testimony is powerful. And it is. It's powerful to convict people. But you know what? There's even better evidence, and that's DNA evidence. 
and DNA evidence has exonerated over 325 people who were convicted, most of them, 75% of them, convicted on the basis of my testimony, direct by seeing testimony. I don't think seeing testimony is any better. In fact, I would doubt whether this is good as believing as a result of not seeing it. You know, for example, that there were many Jewish leaders who saw all of the miracles, saw what Jesus had done, and yet we are told in the 12th chapter of John, they did not believe. I think seeing is even believing. But believing is a result of reading scripture, and that's what we're told. And then Jesus told them, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe. You see, we come to believe by reading our scripture. So now let me go back to the beginning. And I want to challenge each one of us. If God is not in the center of your life, can you this week put him there? Remind yourself to put him at the center of your life. If you are not talking about Jesus or talking to him, except when you come to, on Sunday to church, will you make a commitment to do so this week? To talk to him and talk with him. And if you are in reading scripture as a way of guiding your life, as a way of informing how you should live your life, will you commit yourself to read scripture every day? Let's just make it three times this week. Will you commit yourself to read scripture on at least three different occasions and ask God to come to you as you read his word personally, purposefully, and powerfully? He will. I'll talk to you next week before I get back on the Allison.